In this episode, we discuss predictive analytics for manufacturing. And my guest on this episode is Mashek Vaziak. Mashek is the founder and CEO of Expanse AI, a company that provides a powerful predictive analytics tool that allows you to replace manual data science with AI-driven processing. Mashek has a PhD in applied AI, and for the last 15 years, he has been deploying AI and ML solutions across many sectors, including telecommunications, fintech, healthcare, and more recently, manufacturing. A quick thank you to our sponsors. This episode is made possible by our friends at HiveMQ, who are providers of an enterprise-grade edge and cloud-based MQTT broker. So please do check them out to help support this channel. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on Industry 4 Auto TV, which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn industrial IoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So if you're new here, please do subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the interviews. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with 5,000 Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kudzai Mandi Teresa. Now, here's my interview with Mashek. Mashek, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to welcome you to the show. Hello, Kuzai. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, many thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Okay, so today I would like to talk to you about data science and uh, predictive analytics for manufacturing. Now, to begin, uh, you are the CEO of a company called Expanse AI. Uh, can you tell us uh, about Expanse AI and what the company does? Uh, it's not that simple. Um, uh, I think we'll be talking uh, a bit more later about what exactly goes into predictive analytics and data science process. And it will make it easier to explain what we do on a technical level. But in terms of business impact, we developed a technology that rapidly accelerates data science delivery by essentially automating an awful lot of manual work that is currently executed. And uh, thanks to that, we can offer like mad SLAs for delivery, typically five days for the build of predictive solution, and then another five for deployment, if it's decided to, to, to be done. Um, since then, we started working with companies like uh, SAP or Dell or even Virgin Media. And uh, uh, what we can see, these SLAs can even go um, down as we keep working with the same organization with the same data. Uh, and we also got very like we we initially started in the customer analytics world, but a few years ago we got very strong pull to uh, manufacturing uh, by the industry for zero movement. And we've been emerging ourselves since in, in those projects as well. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so before we dive deep into today's topic, uh, I would like for us to set the stage here for uh, everyone in the audience uh, by first like defining what is data science and uh, what is predictive analytics. Okay, so um, dear, um, data science, is for the most part predictive analytics. And predictive analytics is pretty well defined, while data science is a hot mess. And uh, so what predictive analytics is, is using machine learning to solve business problems, usually. Um, and it's been going on for at least three decades. Uh, it's been called uh, knowledge discovery from databases three decades ago when I was studying it. Uh, then came data mining and knowledge discovery kind of faded away. Uh, then someone forged this unfortunate term, big data. That faded away and was replaced by data science, which seems to be holding strong uh, for, for a decade, I think, by now. So one might ask the question, why changing names uh, if it's pretty much deploying machine learning models in commercial environments. It's the same thing. Nothing has changed. So Kuzai, your, your, your audience needs to know this has been solved for a very long time. And 
it takes roughly five to 10 years it, it was taking to the buyers to realize that um, the reality was not um, matching the promises uh, by the vendors. So they was they 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 were stopped. Uh, they they stopped buying, and vendors had to come up with something else. It's a rebranding exercise. So they rebranded knowledge uh, knowledge discovery uh, to data mining. After that, they rebranded it to big data, uh, and more recently they came up with the data science. It's it's sticky. It it, it sounds nice, and and people also like to be named data scientists. Uh, so essentially, data science is predictive analytics, but it's so much confusion out there in the market. Uh, it's so much difficulties uh, to implement those projects. They are very slow with very high fail rates. That also, it turns out that people who hold titles data scientists, they get pulled out to other work. So most of the data scientists think they study machine learning, but they don't work it. They, as it turns out, they work they work on uh, dashboards, on ad hoc analytics, on data engineering. Uh, so everyone is looking at them and it's like, what is data science? You know. So at the core, data science was supposed to be solving business problems with machine learning. In terms of workloads, it's all over the place. Okay. Yeah. So I I, I totally agree the. Um... Uh, data science is a is a is a more for a, a bit sticky uh, uh, term than the rest of them. I don't know. I think uh, Gartner or is it uh, some other analytics firm that called data science like the sexiest uh, um, uh, uh, job title in uh, in the twenty first century. So yeah, I totally agree that the the data science term is a a bit more sticky than its uh, uh, predecessors. Yeah. So now the majority of our audience here are industrial engineers architects and uh, other manufacturing personnel. Uh, so to set the context here, can you share with us some data science use cases in manufacturing? I can, but also for your audience, uh, they should be made aware that when they read the internet, most of what they read is a made up bullshit. It's just people thinking up applications for machine learning technologies. These people never done it. These people are not doing it. And some of these applications are just not possible to build. So instead of you know peddling this uh, lofty ideas, I would like to just get closer to the ground and maybe talk what we managed to deliver. It may not be as sexy, yeah. uh, but at, at least I know it's possible and it br brought some benefits to, to the organizations. I think one of the first projects we've done was in, um, I have the list here for myself. It's the, it was a yield optimization in, in farming. Uh, so a, a company was growing herbs, uh, like for, for spicing, for, for seasoning. They were getting orders and, you know, it takes between four to five, six weeks to grow a herb, depending on the environmental conditions, but also based on the conditions that are controlled. So it's a mix of stuff that we can control and we can't control. And if you have an order, you know, for that amount of herbs, five weeks from now, you, you, you plant the seeds now and you need to manage this process that they will be ready five weeks from now, not earlier, not later. So how to do it? Well, you need to analyze what drives uh, the, the growth process. And machine learning is perfect for that. So uh, the data was accumulated, you know, everything that we can control and beyond our control across different uh, plant uh, types and machine learning was used to essentially understand what drives the growth process and then used within those next five weeks to adjust the process. So we'll just hit the mark uh, five weeks from now for, for that plant. Um, another example uh, we've been working very recently, it was quality control uh, in pharma manufacturing. So much more serious project uh, where we were analyzing what's causing stoppages of the machine and how to prevent them. Uh, we are analyzing what's causing bad products and, and, and how to fix it, you know. Yeah. Another example, uh, slightly ad adjacent to manufacturing, but very similar from, you know, in terms of problem space. Uh, in, in, in healthcare, in, in a hospital, 
where you have uh, you, when you're planning surgeries and you want to optimize the, the the utilization of the operating theater and staff and how to do it. So every patient has a different length of surgery and it's a doctor's opinion about how long it may take. And then they are trying to fill the, the theater like a week from now with, with planned surgeries. So we built a model that looks at demographics, illness history, uh, illness type now, surgery type, all this data historically. And we trained a model that is just forecasting how long this is going to take for each new patient. And then the, the, the planners can take, it's not doctors anymore, it's just planners take that information and fill up the, the future operating theater with patients. So, you know, they start at eight and they finish at three, not at one. And also when they f finish at three, there are no patients brought to the hospital and left waiting for another night, right? Yeah. Um, I've got two more for you. So, oh, right now we are working for food in, in food production in the in the packaged meat, where we develop system, um, you know, like the, the 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 meat you buy in in a store, it's packed in a special atmosphere, and we build a system that detects right off the factory line, actually on the factory line, that uh, the package is not damaged, so the atmosphere, so it's 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 properly sealed, and it's done in a non-invasive way using imaging technology and and, and machine learning. And and last one uh, I left uh, for now because it's it's quite cool. Uh, it's it's from a semiconductor industry, and I can actually show you and your audience a little bit of that. We we changed the data, yep. and the problem was so it's a semiconductor manufacturer, and they were uh, um, um, etching si silicon wafers, and they had like twenty percent of fail rate. Now. Fail rate, it doesn't have to mean that it's a throwaway. It could be just lower grade chip, right? Yeah. Uh, but we got this data and I can show the screen uh, if you let me share. Okay, okay so I'm, I'm just going to log into our platform. And pull the dashboard here. Just make it a bit bigger. Okay. So uh, we what we did, we, we took the data from hundreds of sensors. We pushed that through the typical uh, data science project. And we identified a, a couple of levers that are very strongly correlated with the failure rate. And they revolved around temperature, uh, around current levels, and also pressure in different parts of the, of the machine. And just to walk your audience through what, what we're looking at, it's a, it's a distribution view where you can see there were like 2,120 batches and like typical distribution of the temperature. So roughly between eight, 850 and nine, 950, right? Uh, the current levels in the middle coil between 65, I guess, volts and, and 75 volts. So it's a distribution view. And what you can do here, you can interact with um, this dashboard and see, for instance, I'm just going to select. So the processes between that we're having this, this current levels between 60 and 65, there were 271 processes. Yep. Um, and then you can move well between 70 and 75, there were like 387 processes. So you can interact with this data on your own. Uh, and uh, wait for it. So what we can do now is overlay this failure rate that you can see here now is 20% on these charts. And the, the red line now is essentially observed failure rate for these parameter levels here in the blue. Uh, so if I just select now these processes again. So current level, so the processes, the 271 processes that this current level was between 60 and 65, uh, the failure rate was 30%. Okay. And you can see, you know, this is the high level of the red line. And now, so I can see, okay, I, I'm looking for the low, I want to lower failure rate. So I move this here 
and it goes down to 16%. Wow. Uh, so that's good from, from average 20. Yeah. And you can interact with other levers as well. So we can see some mad spikes here. So now it's back to like 50%. So any process that was running with high temperature, it's clearly bad. Yeah, yeah. So we need to keep it lower, say roughly in these brackets. Oh, it disappeared. So now our failure rate is 15%. So we increase yield from 80 to 85 if we keep the process in these brackets. Uh, now you can take the last one, which is probably the, the strongest lever. You can see how the failure rate goes down here, right? Yeah. So that's uh, pressure in subchamber, whatever that means. I don't know, I'm not an engineer. But essentially, if you keep pushing this pressure up high, you can see how the failure rate goes down even to 50%. Oh. Sorry, to, 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 to 5%. Five per, five now, so we had a conversation with, with engineers and it's like, we are not sure what we are looking at. We don't know what's possible on the engineering side. We would recommend to keep the process in these brackets if, if you can, to, to limit the, the variation to these values and also keep high pressure and maybe try to experiment with even higher pressure if possible. Oh, okay. This... Uh, because we don't have data for, for higher pr pressure than 196, essentially, right? Yes. Uh, so that was used to adjust the process, and the whole cycle was re repeated. So new data gathered, new analysis, and a new model also deployed that monitors this process. It takes around half an hour for each batch that mo monitors the process real time and alerts the engineers if something's about to go off the rails. But it's a it, it's like simple example how machine learning can play a role, but uh, there is massive delivery when you visualize the data, uh, and and machine learning was like a help to choose what to show, to go from five hundred variables down to six, yes. and and sh and have a conversation with people who own the process, uh, and and then you know go through this very quick cycles of adjusting the process and building new new analysis yeah that's that's really uh, amazing so because yeah i can see that theoretically from a, a a data science perspective you could actually get to a failure rate of zero it then just remains an engineering problem but on data science side of it you can actually tune it down to like zero yeah we can but also you know they immediately told us look it's not possible to keep it in such a narrow brackets well yeah it's not possible now maybe it's worth investigating that they can uh, improve their uh, machinery so they will be able to, to keep it that high you know yes 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 it's it's a, it's now an engineering problem so as soon as they solve that machinery aspect of it which means theoretically we could get to like zero which this is yeah incredible. that's your world we we yeah. only you know <laughs> talk to the data yeah um, yeah this is uh, thanks for sharing this uh, real world uh, uh, applications of, uh, of, of of predictive analytics, like as you said, most of the stuff that you get to read about online is more of like um, not really tangible examples that you could actually relate to. So this is a, will be really useful for the audience. Yeah. So to uh, move on, now the the as you as you as you have already um, mentioned, the the idea of predictive analytics uh, has been around for quite some time, for decades. But I would imagine that with this new wave of technologies, uh, uh, this traditional pre predictive analytics uh, is not the same as the more recent form of predictive analytics or what you would call uh, automated predictive analytics. So can you break down for us what is the difference between traditional and automated predictive analytics? Very well. So I will share the screen again because it it's much better to explain with visuals. There's, there could be new pieces of information for your audience uh, here. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, I can see. 
so to explain the difference between traditional and automated, uh, I want to just walk you through something that may be called like the biggest secret of ML industry. And I will have probably, probably we will continue with another topic like 10 minutes from now to get a little bit more detail about that. But now just about this massive problem that everybody faces when they want to uh, deploy a predictive analytics solution. So this is picture that is often built. And I even saw it in industry 4.0 materials that you know you need to centralize the data to enable machine learning, which is true. Uh, however, it's not working like that um, because machine learning can't really process the data that is accumulated in the in the central data store, and it has different names. So it could be just a database, data warehouse, data lake, or a historian. Uh, it can't process because by the way it's designed, machine learning is very rigid. Uh, it, it requires data in a form of mathematical matrix, very specially and carefully designed. While the data on the left side can be stored in any shape or form, it's usually signals and transactions and dimensions. And, and that's not something you can load to machine learning at all. So there is this wall between data store and machine learning algorithm. And, and, and here is fun fact for your audience. So this table consists of vectors, as we call them, at least we in Expanse, uh, where every column has the same meaning uh, across all the vectors. The database technology was invented in, uh, in 1970. The machine learning technology was invented over 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a guy, a scientist called Carl Gauss, um, and there was a competition um, uh, to predict the trajectory of a comet. It was like over many weeks. And um, th they were building different models by hand trying to, to make the predictions. And this guy uh, uh, put this problem on its head and said, can, can we build like a set of algorithms that math actually will build a prediction function for me? And he took three observations, organized them in a form of vectors in a matrix. And he invented a whole new way of processing data that he later called least squares method. This method now powers half of the machine learning algorithm. And the fact that it's happening in computers uh, didn't really change the fact that the data structure that they require is the same as he organized it 200 years ago. So it's a legacy data structure. It's a, it's a technical debt that we have to deal on every data science project because we need to translate this data as it's stored, as someone came up with the design that is usually to support operations. No one builds a data store with machine learning in mind. They wouldn't even know how to do it. So that's why there are humans in the process. And that's what data scientists are doing. They are busy, busy, busy uh, building um, uh, data transformation pipelines to, to, to make sense, to, to, to convert it to this format of a matrix before they can load it to, to machine learning. And because it's such a long and complicated process, they often fail and they don't even get to the machine learning. Um, from the talks we are having, it seems like 90% of data scientists out there are still on their first project. And quite often this project is already abandoned. So they may be three years on the job, five years on the job, and they haven't delivered a single machine learning based project. So that's the difference between data science when you ask me and predictive analytics. Data science is just a mess at the moment. So you have many tools that can help you with this data transformations, but they are human operated. So this process is just very slow and um, it takes weeks while machine learning really takes minutes or hours. It's just machine doing the work. It's automated, always has been. Um, 
and this is not even mentioning the deployment because inherently during this process, human data scientists, human data scientists develop all these complicated data pipelines that often move between different tools. And when you deploy it, you need to replicate all that in production environment. It's very, very hard and it may fail apart as well. It, 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 it can f f fall apart as well at that stage. So, and it's been done like that since the inception. So most of the data scientists are still doing it that way. It's a long process. It's very manual. It's very error prone uh, and it fails left, right and center. What, what expands auto DS, so automated data science platform is, it removes humans from this process. It doesn't mean there are no humans in data science projects, absolutely not. But in this loop where you tap to the source data, you need to transform it, it still need, needs, needs to happen, uh, to tr transform it to this mathematical matrix, run machine learning on it, and then create easy to deploy pipeline. This is automated data science. This is this is where we fit. So when you initially ask what we do, that's our platform, and that's that allows us this rapid delivery and iterations with with our clients. Uh, so that's the difference. That's yep. the answer to to your question. Yeah, this is um, this is really super 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 interesting. And now, what I would like to know, uh, having uh, gone through this, and uh, perhaps uh, I, I can speak for. Uh, other engineers uh, on this call is to say, once we understand this, what does a standard predictive analytics workflow based on AI and ML look like? Can you describe that for us? I can, and I, again, use the PowerPoint and it's the last time I promise. Yeah, okay, sure, so, absolutely. So it's, so part of this process I just showed a minute ago, right? But how the whole project looks like. Uh, there is a project, there, there's a model how to approach it called CRISPDM, which is cross industry standard for data mining. Again, data mining. Uh, it was developed, I think over 20 years ago, and it's like a follows a few steps. It's, it's a good one, but I think it underscores uh, wrong parts of the process and underestimates others. So I will highlight what's really important on these projects. It's a slightly different view. So first, you need to have data in one place. If you have data still in several places or uh, data may be, you know, uh, be born on the machine and die on the machine, if it's not digitized, there's just no project here. Um, then what we start with is defining business problem. So we talk to people who own the problems on the factory floor, and we discuss with them what, uh, what do they think the problems are that can be solved with the data. And then very often we discuss that, you know, it's not necessarily machine learning that they need. Maybe it's a report, maybe it's an anomaly detection, maybe uh, it's, a, it's a dashboard. But some problems are solvable with, with machine learning. Now, you must realize, Kudzai, that when you put data scientists in the process, they were studied machine learning. For them, machine learning is, is the hammer. And they see every problem as a machine learning problem, which is absurd. So we need to be very careful to not to venture you know, against very simple problems with machine learning when it's not needed. Once we define that, OK, we have this problem, and it looks like a machine learning problem, it's usually when something good or bad happens. So a machine fails or works correctly, or a, a product is flawed, or um, there's a, a, a numerical value that we want to keep in check, or we want to maximize this value, right? Uh, and, and there's data that we can potentially link. Uh, so that sounds like initially like a good problem for machine learning to, to, to ask for help. Then okay. we... Trans, we have to translate this business problem to a data problem, which is essentially something similar to uh, a labeling. I will tell you. So if you de decided in the defining business problem that you need a system to, to differentiate between cats and dogs, 
then uh, you uncovered a lot of images, then you need to filter out all the images that are not cats or dogs, and then you need to put a label on every image. So that's your target, as we call it. This is when we formulated the problem in a, 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 using data. For machines, it could be, it's usually very simple. It's a timestamp of operation time, like minute by minute or second by second, and a flag that it's good, 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 fail. Good, 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 fail. So that's in the data in a table. If we can't do it, then uh, there is no machine learning project. Maybe it's a different project. Maybe we need to gather more data. Maybe we need to approach it differently. But every step, th there's no jumping over any of those steps. Then you tap to the source data. And this is what we talked uh, a couple of minutes ago. We need to prepare the data for machine learning, manu manually or automatically. Uh, and then you have this modeling data set, this magical structure of a matrix that you can feed to machine learning, at which point you can run the machine learning and you are getting a model. Uh, this is a very quick process. You don't really spend much time on this unless you need to go back and redo the whole thing, which sometimes happens. Then there are two more steps. We meet with the, with the problem owners and we discuss the findings. And very often it happens that we look at that with the business, with the engineers, and we decide, well, we need to go back and redo these things. And in the past, redoing was three months. Now redoing could be two, three days. Um, and so we iterate. It's an iterative process until we get the model right or we decide to abandon the project. It may be that there's no correlations. We tried, did our best. There's no more data coming. At least we spent on a couple of days and we move on to a new problem. But it, 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 if it's decided to deploy the model, um, the model is deployed and it's usually as close to the source data as possible. So this is something I would like to stress as well for your audience, not deploying the model is not a failure. It may be actually the right thing to do. Uh, deploying a bad model is a failure. That's interesting. Um, I just threw in here for your audience a breakdown. It's slightly different for manufacturing. So what we saw comparing to customer analytics projects, there's a lot more time spent on deployment. It's more complicated and, and a little bit less time spent on data prep because usually data is, is a, 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 a step lower in terms of complexity. It's not as complex as customer-centric databases. Uh, so here it is, like you, you spend a bit of time on defining business problem, you do this translation, then you do data prep, then very quick machine learning, and then you can, you can deploy the model. Now, he, here's the thing that I want to talk about for, for two minutes. When you look at any data science course in academia or online or anywhere, they don't really do these first three steps because no one has access out in the open to the real database. So you can't teach how to define the target. You can't, you can't do that and you can't teach the data prep. And you know what? Academics don't want to teach that. They just don't. They are not interested in it. Uh, they, are, they, they have plenty of modeling data sets, so they want to dive in it with the students, with the research, and they, that's, that's their starting point. Uh, they also don't do any review sessions and they do any deployment because deployment is happening on the source data, so they don't teach that either. So as a result, when the grads hit the street, they think this is data science, the 5%. Wow. And the reality is hitting them harsh on the head. So uh, yeah, for your audience, I, I just would urge to remember uh, what kind of experience have the data scientists you talk to, how much re of the real world they've really experienced. Uh, because if they are just out of the course, or out of the academia in more general, 
they don't really know the real world and they will fail. Yeah, this is really this is really intriguing. Thank you so much for 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 sharing that uh, information. Now to to move on. So now I I understand what predictive analytics is all about as it relates to 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 manufacturing and I've also got like a a, a complete understanding of the workflow involved to get that going. Now my question is coming from an industrial facility, how do I then identify and perhaps uh, qualify the data sources for predictive analytics in a, in a typical manufacturing facility? Okay, so I wouldn't start with the question about data, so um, data sources. I would start, as I kind of mentioned, with, the, with looking for the problem to solve. So which problems are real pain, which are not? And then which painful problems uh, could be solvable with data? And then which data is it? So the power of predictive analytics is that if you have sufficient amount of target data, you can throw almost any input data at it. And the, the purpose of machine learning is to see through that and to detect what's correlated, what's not. So you can also... To a point, you can, as long as your target is defined well, you can throw a garbage at it, and machine learning will find the, the the golden nuggets. It's not always the case, but uh, quite often it it happens closely to that. Uh, in manufacturing, what we see there is a huge problem of of data being born and and dying on on machine. It's not collected. Uh, so we can't really progress before this data is properly stored. And then it's it's a process that never ends because you collect most important data and then you have medium important data, then least important data, and then you add sensors, add data capture, and you keep collecting more and more. So this process usually never ends. Um, and it's so uh, machine specific as well. So, so machines are so old that they don't have any sensors. And the only way to capture the data is to build infrastructure around them. Uh, so it's very specific. Um, usually engineers uh, are extremely good source of knowledge. So we talk to them when we uh, uh, talk about the problems. And then we talk to them when we ask, well, what do you think? What can correlate with that? We don't know. You, you know. Just and go as broad as possible, like go wild. You don't have to give us a prescription that these five factors correlate. You can give us 300 if, if the data is about them. And then we'll, we'll take it and we'll run through this process that I just showed and we'll come back with uh, what's correlated. Oh, okay. Interesting. Now, Going back to 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 the workflow, uh, the process that you just presented to us, what I find really intriguing there uh, is the fact that uh, data preparation accounts for about fifty percent of the time that you you you, you spend on that uh, a predictive analytics process. And it's interesting, really, for me because, as you would know, in industrial facilities, there is a wide variety of data sources uh, using like mostly different and incompatible data structures. So there you would imagine that uh, th there's a lot of work that needs to go into uh, uh, kind of uh, normalizing that data for predictive uh, modeling. So what I would like to find out to you is how do you manage this kind of data variety for, 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 for predictive modeling? So Kuzai, that's a part of the problem that you build, uh, you, you you approach one problem and you get one set of data and uh, you need to develop custom built handmade transformations that are not transplant to, tra transplantable to other problems. And you have to do it again. So we are very conscious of that and that's why our technology is helpful to a point. Um, it's, it's challenging, it's difficult. Uh, if done manually, it's very error prone. So we, you know, error prone as a, as in we build certain data transformation that we think is doing that, but it's doing something else. And then when we deploy it, we run into trouble. Uh, automation helps 
because machine doesn't make mistakes. Um, what I would also like to say that what uh, what makes this challenge even even bigger is that almost every problem needs a separate model. So we, if we build a model for one machine, it's not going to work for another machine. We need to build a different model. If we if, even on the same machine, you know, if if it's meat packaging model and it happens to run on ice cream packaging on some other days, there are two different models. Even two different packet sizes may may cause uh, the need for 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 more models. So uh, it's not it's not specific to manufacturing. We see it everywhere. These models are very very narrow. They only operate. It's like cats and dogs, right? You build model for cats and dogs. It only will work for cats and dogs. It, it will not work for any other animals. Uh, so it's the same uh, everywhere. These models are very, very specific. And what we see we with our clients, this ability of build and deploy. So build and test like 300 models and deploy 50 of them very quickly. Uh, so it's not just one or two models as it used to be in history. It was taking a lot of time, a lot of resources. And because everybody was so invested, it was usually branded as a success, even if it was a failure, because no one would like to say that it failed after spending $200,000 on it, you know? So now it's a different reality when you can test and run, test and run. Uh, and if the model is good and useful, you deploy it. If, if it's not useful, you just d discard it and you just keep iterating very quickly uh, and moving from one problem to another. It's a different reality. You, you approach it in a different way. Uh, it's no longer a project. It's no longer an initiative. It's a whole program on which you build many models and you are not invested into the, necessarily deploying all of them because you don't have to, because it's cheap and fast. Uh, so, yeah, it's a challenge, but the technology comes with help. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, can you just help me understand this one quickly before we move on to the next question? Uh, is it a good thing that we need like a model for each machine, or do we do we do, do we hope that uh, sometime uh, in the future we could have like one generic model that is capable of handling different types of machine? Is it is it a good thing, or to to actually have this uh, distinct model, or do you think? Um, I I think at the moment where we are in and in the near future, if you had ten models with like low level of complexity, you can have one model, but it will be just ten times more complex. So, is there a benefit in it? Maybe at the moment what we are doing, there's a lot what's happening after model deployment that needs to be monitored and maintained that no one is talking about. And that's the focus we bring to our clients as well. So if you get 20, 30, 50 models, if you don't have monitoring system, they will start failing and you will not even know it. If you have one big model, that wouldn't be much different. Like it may fail in this machine and you need to monitor that, right? Um, maybe in the future, there will be more, there will be more um, integration that you can just throw the data and say, these are my 50 problems, right? Go build one model, yeah. <laughs> but you still need to monitor them for every machine, for every data source, for every problem. You need to monitor them separately. Oh, interesting, interesting. All right, so now predictive analytics uh, uh, solutions are fundamentally driven by uh, predictive modeling technologies like under the hood. And I know this is like a lengthy topic, but can you give us a high level description of uh, predictive modeling techniques uh, that may be applicable perhaps in manufacturing? Um, it's actually quite simple. And data scientists love to overcomplicate that. But uh, there are two main types of models. One is based on rules and the other is based on math. So uh, the models based on rules, they are essentially if-then rules. So 
if there is a, an audio level of the, of the sensor, in, you know, exceeds that amount and another condition is met and another condition is met, then uh, put an alert on because it's a high risk. It's like 50% risk of machine failing in the next 15 minutes. Now, the, you can handcraft these rules based on your experience. What machine learning is doing, it's doing it automatically based on examples, right? But it's still if then rules. It's just a lot of them. Uh, and and sometimes it's you know tens, sometimes it's hundreds, sometimes it's thousands of rules that just smash together and are like making pr predictions collectively. You know, uh, the machine learning based on functions, it's just like y equals you know a multiplied by x. Just there's many x's and many a's, and again increase complexity, but it's functional. It, it, it's 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 math. Uh, and then you 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 smash uh, like hundreds or thousands of these functions together, and you are getting a neural network, and it's fancy name, right? Yeah. Uh, but but it's linear regression, non non linear re regressions like logistic regression, and then you have neural networks, and they are all kind of in this realm of uh, mathematical functions. So they are like these two groups uh, 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 that compete on the market, um, and they are very effective. Oh. Interesting. Now, other thing that I wanted to uh, find out from you is um, now, as you would know, that manufacturing consists of uh, processes that in many cases require real time or, or, or time critical decision making. So how how do machine learning processes meet these uh, real time shop floor requirements? Um, it's a challenge. And again, we could talk probably for a long time, but that's probably the first question we ask if we when we identify the problem with the engineers well we ask well how frequently you want an assessment from the model is it once an hour once a minute or every second and then well if they say like you know every second then or like every few seconds then we always ask well what's the what's the latency expected here because nothing is really real time right it's impossible uh, and, and how long time do we have? It, it drives the entire project. If they say, you know, it's like uh, a, a, a quarter of a second, then it drives uh, how we approach the data. It, it, it drives which machine learning technique we are choosing. We are trying to keep it everything very lean, very simple. And yeah, we will get a bit lower accuracy at the end, but at least we meet this latency. Uh, if if the latency is a bit longer, then we we can build a bit more complex models as well. But it's a number, probably number two co consideration uh, when we approach that. The, and this is also what makes the manufacturing different from customer analytics. You don't often get these real time requirements in in customer analytics. Sometimes they do. Uh, but most of the applications is not. So uh, it's a it's a challenge. We had to learn how to do it, and uh, painfully. So now we always ask upfront. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Now, I would imagine that uh, for it to be effective, uh, the application of predictive analytics uh, in, in in manufacturing or or any domain for that matter would require some some form of domain level uh, expertise. Now. What I'd like to know is to what extent is, is domain level uh, expertise required and, and what role do domain experts uh, play in the in the implementation of a predictive analytics solution? It's it's massive. So we wouldn't be able to do anything without um, working hand in hand with, with engineers. They need to show us around the floor. They need to talk to us about the problems. When we show them like, on the dashboard where we show them, we're always a bit anxious because we don't know if any of that makes sense. It usually it does, but before we get confirmation, we don't. And then uh, like there's no replacement of that. We can only show them what storage data is telling, but they need to overlay their experience, what's possible, what's not. Uh, they, they need to point out some rubbish as well sometimes. So then we need to go back and iterate. So there's no automating experience. Oh, interesting. So maybe another group of uh, of stakeholders, because uh, right now you mentioned that you, you you work mostly with engineers on the shop floor, and 
uh, traditionally, uh, automation systems have been implemented by system integrators. So what I would like to find out uh, from you is based on, on the, some predictive analytic solutions like Expanse AI, what role do system integrators play there? Uh, well, they are central in a sense that uh, before they come, uh, we usually can't do any AI slash, slash ma ma machine learning work. And this is how we actually got to manufacturing. The system integrators came to us. I think we, we work very closely with Irish-based galleries. This is what they do. They digitize assets. They bring data into one place. Without that, we are just looking at the machines and we can wave at them, you know. Yeah. So they are they are central. We are we are uh, we started collaborating with more and more of them, and um, they are our our door to manufacturing, really. Oh, interesting, interesting. So now, uh, last uh, but um, not least, there are a few data scientists that work in manufacturing facilities or in system integration companies. And in fact, most professionals in the industrial automation space do not even have a software background. So with that said, what do you see as being the major challenge of working with AI or, or ML uh, solutions for, for, for manufacturing personnel? I think everybody could use more education, but it's hard to come by more education about which problems are solvable with which analytical techniques. So, you know, there's a couple of buckets here. There's not that many. There is reports, there's alerts, there's anomaly detection, uh, and then you can have maybe interactive dashboards, and then you may have ML solutions, maybe one or two more. So everybody could use this better education and understanding of which problems go to which buckets. Uh, that would prevent many projects from failing, many initiatives from, from failing. Uh, and so many problems are, sol are, are solvable with other techniques than machine learning. Um, and I, I actually see manufacturing as a very fertile ground for machine learning. There's an awful lot of data after it's integrated. There's a lot of problems. Things get broken all the time. And yes, there is no data scientist around because data scientists, here's a little secret for you, hate analyze machine generated data. They much more prefer analyze human generated data. So they are just not around uh, or much fewer of them. Uh, so there is also less experience in, in what's possible, what's not. Uh, I think this education on identifying problems uh, and matching analytical techniques to them, I think there's huge gap in experience. Um, it's hard to say, you know, who should have it? Is it like a special role? Is so someone like chief analytics officer who should have the skill set an experience to be able to identify the problems with engineers and channel them into different initiatives, uh, some of them being machine learning. Um, a, a second thing maybe while we're getting to the close, there's so much that is still to be learned about what happens. I, I mentioned that what happens after the models are deployed. Very few companies actually got there anywhere in any industry. Very few companies have experience uh, with working with deployed models. It's terra incognita. Like to find business people who would be consuming real outputs of machine learning models for more than a year or two. There's very few of them. Uh, so everybody seems to be new to this, what happens after that. It's very interesting. Um, okay. So there's more, more to that than just machine learning. I hope I passed that message loud and clear. Yeah, I think that would be certainly uh, interesting. I mean, bearing in, in mind that we uh, see and hear a lot about uh, predictive analytics all over the place, but to to actually hear from you say that there's very few uh, people that are working with uh, models that have been deployed here, it's really something that uh, will add in a perspective to, uh, to the audience and to the show. So yeah, that uh, brings us to the end uh, of this uh, conversation. Mashek, thank you so much for taking the time to come out here and share your insights with the audience. My pleasure, Kudzai. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you. And thanks for allowing all, all the rants and PowerPoints. Yep. Take care.